And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator, uh, creator of the of Chaotic Flux, which is which is currently in demand on its second issue, with a third one um, coming l a little bit later on this year. The one and only, don't call him a major, Scott Payne. Hello, everybody. <laughs> how you doing, so, man? Pretty good, how are you, bud? I'm do I'm doing good. Um, so it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings. So. Uh -huh. What what gave you the what gave you the writing bug um, to to try and venture out into doing something like comics? Um, well, a lot of it comes from uh, just kind of my upbringing. Um, my I okay, so I never really knew my dad, but I knew he was big into science fiction and fantasy because. I had his old. I still have his old copy of Lord of the Rings, and uh, I have some of his old comic books, and um, so that kind of sparked me early on, um, as well. I mean, pretty pretty young, and then but of course also all the wonderful TV that was out in the eighties and Ninja Turtles and GI Joe and Transformers and mm -hmm. and um, and then the X Men animated series came out in the nineties, and that one really captivated me. Uh, as far as getting into comic books and appreciating them. And I started collecting the X-Men books and, and I started getting into Spider-Man and Batman and some other books mm -hmm. here and there. And uh, I also was able to, my mom, uh, she grew to like science fiction very much like me. Um, also because my father got her real into it when they were together. Um, they, like for instance, they saw Alien when I was, in my mom's stomach and uh, uh which is one of my most favorite movies and uh my mother when i was 13 she was okay with me she 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 saw me watch some adult you know rated r sci-fi and stuff before and she didn't see any negative effects of, of it on me so she was letting me rent movies at blockbuster um dark science fiction like robocop and aliens and terminator um and Akira, I saw Akira for the first time when I was 13. That movie just blew my mind. And films like that really made me appreciate uh, not only stark storytelling, but dark storytelling and big dramatic moments and uh, scary moments and big action. And so all these things started influencing me. And about the time when I was 18, I started thinking about this idea to uh, create my own comic book. And since I love all these things, also video games, I was really big into video games, still am today. Um, and so all these things, different comics, movies, TV shows, video games, anime, uh, started sparking this idea in my mind to create a comic book that is, um, as much as possible, can incorporate a lot of these things. Um, so I wanted a storyline where there's uh, um, an alien invasion that happens. There's a big transforming mecha. There are exosuits. There are mutant monsters. Uh, there is also magic users or some sorcery type characters involved and great powerful uh, magics. And, and But I was trying to figure out how to, it took a while to develop the story because I was trying to figure out how to make it all work, how to all fit together, not feel disjointed and strange as far as like, oh, okay, here's a sorcerer all of a sudden with a giant mech, you know? Um, so I, over the years, started fleshing out the story and putting the pieces together right. And finally, uh, a few years ago, it felt... Well, I also did a lot of procrastination, to be honest, over the years. I played a lot of video games, got distracted. But finally, a few years ago, I sat down and it hit me how to finally put all the pieces together right and, and make it feel really good. Uh, so then I started s sitting down and, and writing the script. Uh, well, the first script. Um, big part of it was to prove that I could even sit down and write a comic book script after doing research on how to even write one. And after a couple months, I was done with the first script. 
and went and found my artists, and here we are today. I can de- I can definitely get that. Um, now now, given given the given the talk of um, of Mecca, one th- one thing I'm curious about is. Somebody, wherever somebody first got introduced to Mecca, that tends mm-hmm. to be a reflection of how, of how they see of how they see the Mecca genre go, going forward and the kind of mm. Mecca that they prefer. Um, mm. And in fact, a good friend of mine and I have constantly gotten into gotten into fights about dif- about different Mecca types. Um, mm-hmm. So, what was your introduce? What was your introduction to the whole idea of gi- of giant robots? I would have to say Transformers was, I think, my first, um, yeah, big introduction, um, and and then Robotech. I saw Robotech when I was pretty young when it first started airing here in the U.S. Blew my mind. Love that show still today. It's one of my most favorite uh, TV shows. And um, I, so I'm a big, I mean, I, I and I love Gundam as well, mm-hmm. and even Galleon. Even though Galleon's more of a you know, bio mech, but still technically a mech. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, in the case of my mech, that um, is one of the main characters in Chaotic Flux. He is a kind of, again, a kind of a culmination of a lot of these things. He's, um, well, he starts out a little bigger than a person, and but he has the ability. Well, with lots of armor, if you can imagine. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he has the ability to um, self-adapt, self-engineer, and he can take other um, metal things and um, you know, like things that, are, as far as like uh, explosives and gunpowder and stuff mm-hmm. like that, and build onto himself and make weaponry and more armor and make himself bigger. Um, and he can also transform, uh, where he can turn his entire body into different things. So he can turn to a ship mode. There's a bombard mode. He turns in bombardment mode, where he turns to like a whole bunch of cannons. Um, there's also a uh, so the ship mode will turn it to a, a large ship mode uh, later in the series, where he can transport the team around in, and he'll also turn into land vehicles and various other things. So he's kind of this, I guess, if you will, ultimate transforming mecha <laughs> that i came up with that i that uh, um i thought was pretty awesome mm-hmm. and um so yeah i guess just really wanted you know like i love mechas and i you know just really wanted a big awesome one in my series and uh good personality too he has more of a um kind of at first, he's a little childlike, but he adapts very quickly. Also, his his AI, so he learns quickly, and 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 um, is also designed to learn how to fit in with humans well, and not make them feel uncomfortable or you know out of place. And um, he befriends uh, one of the other main characters named Strife. I'm not Strife. I'm sorry, Soren, mm-hmm. who Soren is the leader of the team, uh, and he's the exosuit pilot that's in the storyline. And they they become good buds in the series, so they develop this kind of, you know, I guess you could say good friends, but also I mean, imagine being friends with a huge mecha. It'd be like having this huge, I guess, you know, super. <laughs> you know, it, it kind of make, makes me think of like movies when when uh, someone befriends a dragon, or um, you know, some other powerful creature, iron giant. Thank you. It's, it'd be along that line, um, where they film the, they form this strong bond. And learned a lot, you know, a lot about each other through their uh, their relationship. Yeah, and when I I will I will admit, since you mentioned exosuits and all these all the stuff that you grew up um, watching, I'm curious if Exo Squad was another thing that you had been. Oh to. yeah, <laughs> and um, I love that show. I had a bunch of the toys too. Mm-hmm. Man, and I just, I think, I can't remember what streaming service it's on. I want to say it's Hulu. I just got discovered it like a few weeks ago. It was on there. I was like, oh man, I got to sit down and watch some Exo Squad when I got some time. Exo Squad, I, I, I'm of the opinion that that was the best show to be, to, that got put out at the worst time. Yeah. Yeah. Because the pro- the problem is that show was coming out just as people were raving about how good um, Batman the Animated Series looked. Right. Which, no disrespect to that, but the problem yeah, is, um, shows too. <laughs> what 
the problem is Exo Squad look looked very much like it was still in the like it was a um like it was an eighties show. Right. And it was made in the nineties. That's that was the pro that was the um core problem. Um mm -hmm. I'm also tempted to bring up the Battletech cartoon, although that's a whole other can of worms. Least of which because it's Battletech, and and more of which because they try. That was one of those attempts to try and integrate um, CG into shows. Didn't quite work. I'm trying to remember what Battletech was. Um, are you familiar with the Mech Warrior games? Yes. That's in that same universe. Um, oh, okay. There was, it had gotten a it had gotten a cartoon back back in the day. It's um ah, I didn't know they had a show. Yeah, it the the big problem was not um trying to do CG in the in the nineties, which was a bit of a trend. The only um the only studio that was really able to get a handle on it, and and this and even that might be a little bit generous was the studio that did um. Reboot and Beast Wars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if it was the same studio. Those, those two. Those. No wonder the animation was was kind of similar. That makes sense now. Yeah. Um. And w now, the now the the main reason that I asked about something like Exo Squad is when it comes to um, Soren Ravenholm's um, armor, the mm -hmm. uh, dam the damage suit. Which isn't exactly like the exo the stuff in Exo Squad, but mm -hmm. um, in fact, I'd say in fact I'd say it's got more in common with with stuff like um, Giver or, or uh, Techaman Blade or Techaman mm -hmm. as we knew it at first. Um, but yeah, I do uh, see I do see the uh, connections. Right. Yeah, Techaman was. Uh... I, I I haven't I didn't get to see too much of that one, but I really love the style of it, that show, mm -hmm. um, the designs, the monster designs too, the aliens that you had to fight, and mm -hmm. the action and everything. But um, so yeah, that's definitely an influence. Um, there's some Gundam in there too, uh, but it is more on the, I guess. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, what's another? Uh, I'm drawing a blank, but it's I I I went I wanted to kind of kind of like Iron Man, but more so more on the the stylistic kind of anime style with big bold weaponry, mm -hmm. but still sleek and maneuverable and fast in battle. Um, so I really like the idea of getting these tentacles on its back with the blades on the end of them. And uh, the main idea behind that is so that when he's fighting in combat, doing his thing, the blades actually have an AI camera on the end, of, like a sensor on the end of them. Mm -hmm. And they actually seek out enemies and fight around him doing their own thing while he's doing his thing. Um, I thought it was pretty badass. And um, the arms, the forearms transform into cannons, which can fire all types of different type of or different types of uh, uh, ammunition. Mm -hmm. uh, his suit has nail tech built in, not quite on the Iron Man level where the whole suit changes and all that stuff, but like in uh, Infinity War, but more concentrated on the weaponry itself. So yeah. the arms can uh, create different types. I mean, the nail tech can create different types of ammo uh, for him to fire, and um, and then real quick back on Techno Man, Techno Man, he actually has a kind of spear weapon that he forms similar. It looks similar to Techno Man's, but actually transforms uh, where there's kind of these triangular blades on the ends. So there's mm -hmm. two of them on each end. And they'll extend connected by a, a kind of um, energy um, cable that connects them. And he can spin it around and do all kinds of cool tricks with it. Um and then he also has some really cool hidden stuff, which I don't want to say uh, yet, but uh, people will see that later in the series. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the things I liked about some of the, you know, the um, like Techno Man and, and Guyver, how he'll have those hidden abilities. He just pulls out and like annihilates enemies, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I really like the, the, the big surprise weaponry. So you'll, yeah. you'll see that in the series later for sure. And actually, Guyver was going was gonna to be one of the ones I was, I was, going, to, I was going to mention. Mm -hmm. When it comes when it comes to ex when it comes to examples on how on this particular design, mm -hmm. um, 
even though that doesn't quite qualify because um, Giver is significantly more um, organic. Right. Um, of course, if I if I wanted to, I could also bring up certain versions of um, Common Rider, but I'm not sure how familiar you are with that with that particular milestone. No, haven't yeah. heard that one. Um, that's a, that's a that's a story that's a story for another day because if I go down that I'm going to be going down a rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> well, that's another thing too. Like you know, we're trying to sit here. I'm trying to sit here and think of other um, series with exosuits, and there's not a whole lot. You know, there's not a whole lot of movies and series. Um, so it feels pretty good, you know, to also bring another one, you know, to the table, um, introduced to the world. Um, but same thing with Mecha. I mean, I know there's a lot of Mecha, but mm-hmm. yes, me, there's never enough Mecha. So, <laughs> no, especially, and, and especially, especially in comics, you don't see a lot of Mecha in comics and, and big transforming robots as much as I, I wish that we did, we would. Well, the big problem, the big problem is every time, every time Mecha keeps coming out, there's always, there's always that one guy, even if it's a, even if it's a girl, they still count as that one guy. Mm-hmm. You know the the person who has, who has to jump in and talk about how about how impractical a tw- a twenty five foot mecha would be and how it would fall <laughs> over its own weight and tanks are better at uh-huh. everything at everything and I'm like, which is funny because they're making mechas now that stand on their own and move around. It's like, you know, Japan's been making mechs for a while now. I mean, they're not like Gundam level mecha, but still, you know, there yeah, there is a um, you're familiar, there used you're to familiar be with a uh, moving Gundam in Yo- that's being built in Yokohama, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's freaking awesome. Mm-hmm. And it's funny how many. I'm I'm curious. I haven't looked it up, but I'm curious how many huge mecha. I mean, huge Gundam statues there are now, especially the ones that actually change and move, because it seems like every couple of years at least they're building another one somewhere. Um, I remember a couple of years ago for the um, the Gum- Gundam uh, Expo that they do every year, the big mm-hmm. convention, and they had the unicorn Gundam where the armor actually changed to the unicorn mode, yeah. um, and lit up. That was freaking awesome. If I want to be pedantic, the mode is the mode is called NTD, but um, mm. but again, that's that's me being that's that's me being um, anal ret- anal retentive because well, right. details <laughs> are part of my job, um, right? But the the but when it but you are right the the whole concept of exosuits isn't. I mean, I I see it a I see it a lot more in live action tokusatsu than I do in um mm. in an, in anime or in comics and especially not as often in comics because and this is what and this is why I'm glad for the rise of the indies for for the longest for decades I'd say I'd say for most of our lives there's been this notion that if you're doing comics it has to be superheroes right. Yep. And, and that's one of the other things like I mean I mm-hmm. Catholic Flux kind of began as a superhero idea years ago when I was first developing it but like I said I, I I didn't I started liking the idea well that too I wanted to make characters that were pretty well different from each other but still fit together so I was like well you know I could do like a kind of Justice League thing or something like that where they're they're similar you know pretty similar just different powers but I was like no I want to go the extra mile so you know, like I said, I didn't love all this stuff, so I wanted to incorporate mechas and exosuits and sorcerers and alien hybrids and yeah. So <laughs> I was like, forget that. And even you know, they could still—they're still superheroes. They're mm-hmm. just not, you know, the traditional superhero because they're more—they're more like they're—they've—they've they've come together to basically um, prevent the apocalypse, mm-hmm. if you will. Um, as opposed, I mean, I know the superheroes do that a lot in the comic books. But I don't think really hardly any of them actually come together for that specific reason. You know, they come together just to fight crime at first or, you know. Yeah. And I'd say, I'd say, I'd say, I'd say, um, that might, that might have been, that might have been for the best in the long run that you didn't go for that because Mm -hmm. if you were to try and do something Justice League esque, um, you might have had to introduce, you might have had too much that you'd need to introduce all at once. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's another thing, too. Like, I'm trying to... You know, it took me a while to figure out how to do the pacing, how to how to ease people into the story, um, and then and to not just throw everything at them all at once, and then they're just like, whoa, what the... You know, is that that's something that I've seen 
other creators try to do and it doesn't work. Sometimes it does, depending on what it is, but it's hard to do that, I think. Um, but also, I mean, me as a reader, I wouldn't want to be that overwhelmed either. So I try to think about, you know, what I would like to read mm-hmm. um, in comic books and what, what kind of art, and characters and that stuff. And, and um, But also, I think a lot of movies have done really well to where they easy win. Like in, in the X-Men, like the first X-Men movie where, you know, they introduce, you know, you, you follow Wolverine's path into the world of the X-Men and they're, you know, they're not just all of a sudden boom, all the X-Men are there and you're like, Oh, who are all these people? If you're not an X-Men fan, but you know what I mean? And when, um, like, a, like if, if I wanted to use an example of what not to do when, it, when doing the whole, we need a super team kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, look at what happened with young blood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I still have one of those. I think I have issue zero, <laughs> but I never, I wasn't that much in young blood, so I didn't buy too many of those, but, uh, I can't necessarily blame you. Um, yeah, even, even McFarlane called, called, um, life held the idiot. And he was oh, really, I didn't know that. Wow. But, um, what, what was, so chaotic flux is going for a, um, post-apocalyptic approach i guess i i guess i can put it and Mm -hmm. what was what was the impetus to take that particular route over over others because you said this started out as wanting to do a superhero thing but kind of morphed into something else with time right well um a big part of it is those are some of my most favorite movies um the ones that like the and, and storylines too, like um, uh, in comic books and other things, but um, you more associate movies, I think, where the characters are pushed to their limits mm-hmm. um, in terms of their capabilities of of um, fighting something uh, really powerful against them. Um, and I mean, there, you can't get much more, you know, dramatic and over the, you know, um, uh, I guess I say. Uh, um, Tense as like trying to you know end an apocalypse, um, and in terms of like superhero side of it, I, I should I didn't mention it earlier, but um, the storyline X Men Age of Apocalypse, uh, I'm a huge fan of that storyline. Um, I would have to say it's probably my most favorite X Men story, and um, one of the main reasons is in that story the characters are pushed to their absolute limits in terms of their powers and learning how to work together as a team and, and really, really survive uh, against uh, incredible odds. And um, I, I wanted to make a comic like that where the heroes are just pushed to their limits and, and have to learn to adapt and evolve and as much as possible or else, you know, they not only do they die, the rest of the world is going to end. And, um, I don't know. I just, I guess I just want to start big <laughs> um, as far as my first comic. And um, now I have other comic ideas too. that aren't so, you know, insane, but, uh, but yeah, I just, I just really went for it with this one. And uh, I wanted to see a story like this, like I said, where, you know, it's this, this do or die kind of situation with these really, you know, badass characters and, and really crazy villains um, with the, there was an alien invasion years before that, and now you, they're having to deal with these mutant monsters taking over. And mm-hmm. there's also some evil cyborgs. And later comes in Malakar, who is this really powerful uh, dark entity who um, is basically, well, he, he not basically, he is the uh, embodiment of all the uh, hateful thoughts of mankind. And he embodies this man named um, Gabriel. Yeah, to interact with our world and uses him as his vessel to um, uh, inhumanity because Malakar believes that if uh, he ends humanity, no, nothing will be left to generate his existence. And then he can finally rest in peace because he hates his own existence. He just mm-hmm. wants to, he's been around life for, you know, a long time and, and he's just made up of hate and, and everything. He just mm-hmm. wants to end it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so now <laughs> I guess that's another thing too. Like I mean, I got all these layers. Like all these, it's not just like they're trying to fight one apocalypse. They're really trying to fight a couple of them. But uh, um, but I like that idea too. Of, of you know, 
like I said, push these characters to the absolute limit and um, and and keep things keep them on their on their toes um, pretty often and and keep the audience on edge. Um, so lots of big surprises <laughs> coming, that's for sure. Yeah. And uh, really really awesome battles and and tense situations. And in that re- in that in that particular regard, since you mentioned the whole concept of of aliens, um, mm-hmm. even even with that, given uh, given the nature of the of the of the other protagonist with um, Zathara, mm-hmm. would it be fair to say that the that um, when it comes to the whole, when it came to the whole alien invade? The whole alien invasion that particular that particular part is is at the phase of look the hu- the humans and aliens can kill each other later. There's bigger problems to deal with. <laughs> well, yep, yeah, kind of. It, uh, um, it's it's more. I mean, I wanted to give her a a really bold and um, interesting backstory, and um, I mean that what comes from that is. So there was a um, uh, an alien race that were trying to um, wipe out humanity and take over all of our resources, take over our planet, mm-hmm. and uh, it's you know, kind of a you know uh, familiar story as far as alien invasion go. But um, the uh, Zathara's race, the, the Zakaran. They uh, actually come to humanity's rescue. Where okay, so the aliens, um, uh, I think it's the Malaketh is what I called them, mm-hmm. but they um, they're on they're all like they were just about to um, end it all for humanity, and and then the Zakarans show up and blast the. The uh, the other guys, and to enough to where they then leave, and in humanity, uh, or humans, we we you know of course look at them as our you know our saviors, our, our you know so we create a, a friendship with them and and you know learn about them and learn about their technologies and what have you. Um, but then the uh, um, the the other aliens they go to uh, the Zakarin's homeworld. And they find them their home world and start attacking them. So then the Zakarans have to leave and go defend their home. But during this time, it takes it takes place over a couple of years where they were living among humans, and and, and interacting with us and, and what have you. And there were some hybrids born. Some you know humans fell in love with the, the aliens and 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 what have you, or just you know want to see what it's like to have sex with an alien, I guess, or what have you. <laughs> anyway, and so some alien children, you know, hybrid children, were were created. Um, but the, the problem was though, that they're, um, the human side of them, uh, so their, their atmosphere where their home world is, it's a little different than ours. It takes them getting used to, um, and they didn't want to bring the children with them because they were afraid that one day would have to, you know, you weren't sure if they were going to adapt very well. And two, you know, there's an invasion going on back home, so let's not bring the kids back home with us. And anyway, so they um, they go back to their home world, leaving the children, and the children they uh, they the human the military decided you know take them in and 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 protect them because there's also this organization called the Order of the Purging Hand, who is a uh, a hate group. The very precious hate group against the, the the aliens themselves and the the hybrid children, and they've started hunting down the children. So the military uh, create this facility called the Lateralus um, uh, facility where they house the children and protect them. Mm-hmm. And that's um, one of the things that happens in issue one. It kicks off, and and, and you'll see more of it uh, in. You see a little bit more in issue two, and you see a good amount more in issue three, and then the issue four takes place all within the Lyra's facility. And um, through this, those moments, you you get to see Zathara when she was young, and how she learns to become a warrior, um, how she learns to master, starts to learn to master her powers and accept her um, 
her true what she thinks is perhaps her true calling is to be you know a protector mm -hmm. of of others uh, the, and um and you also get um like i said introduced to their order of the purging hand more and why they do what they do and and where they come from their how they built up their because they're like these mercenaries they used to be military um mostly and then they there's some other stuff though i don't want to get into uh, that's in issue three um that no spoilers so <laughs> but anyway um they do though eventually in the present they've become cyborgs and how that comes to be is their leader um thrax's prime mm -hmm. he uh um something really except something happens to him in issue three to where then he's um turned into this the cyborg as a new weapon for the organization well he starts to he, the the he's turned into a cyborg through extremely complex um nanotech and the he's able to control his nanotech in the sense where he can make it go out and infect others and turn mm -hmm. them cybernetic and control them and uh he takes advantage of this and um uses to overthrow the order purging hand and become their leader uh mm -hmm. self-proclaimed leader and turn all of his soldiers into now cyborgs under his under his control and uh and he's hell-bent on finding uh zathara and uh and ending her once and for all so that's another uh villain layer there it's <laughs> Yeah, I get it. Um, now, er earlier you had earlier when it came to the ideas that you were um, that you had met that you wanted to integrate. Um, mm -hmm. You had you had mentioned wanting to in wanting to integrate magic, and I'm I'm guessing that it that while it isn't strictly speaking magic, there is mm -hmm. a there is a kind of magic equivalent that the Zakarin have a and and um hybrids have access to actually the the sakarans the, the um they're more like um uh mutants in the sense of like the x-men mm -hmm. where some of them have natural abilities um but their abilities are um mainly they, they they're they evolve through for for survival reasons um you know you're it's it's more like um survival reasons but also like to protect others um so you're not going to get a zathar a zakar and that can like you know um i guess like uh shoot energy beams that kind of thing it, it's more like Sasar herself she creates crystal like structures mm -hmm. um that she can use as different types of weaponry um but uh, she also uses it in another interesting way where um, nah, she, I, I, I almost, well, I don't want to say anything. I don't, there, it, it, she does something in issue one and people haven't read issue one, but it's a, it's a pretty cool surprise. But anyway, she, she, as she goes on, she learns how to use her ability in new interesting ways. And, and there's a big change for her actually uh, coming in issue three um, where she goes to this uh, pretty powerful evolution. Mm -hmm. But um I don't know. It's just they're they're more like I wanted to get have them more like a natural evolution as opposed to they just have badass powers. I guess um, not. Don't get me wrong. The powers are pretty mm -hmm. badass that I've given them. But uh, and um, the magic side of it though is um, there's a, there's three characters there in the storyline. Um, two of them are two more of the heroes uh, on the team, uh, the Crimson Flame. And one is um, Nalaria, and the other one's Pagan. Nalaria is a fire-based mage um, who also uses some some water um, abilities. And then her father is Pagan, and he's a plant-based uh, um, mage. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the magic that they use. I went with the kind of... Um, let's see, I know there's some other stories that use the idea, but... Um, that our reality still doesn't ha it doesn't have magic mm -hmm. um, in the storyline, but they're able to tap into another reality and pull. They're, so basically, they're like summoners in that sense. Mm 
yeah. they're pulling magic from this other reality to use in our reality. And um, and then there's like for instance, pagan he can actually pull um, creatures from this other dimension to ours and use them uh, for different things like in combat and what have you. Um, so there's a little bit of a you know extraterrestrial, I guess you could say side to the magic in that sense, but uh, um, and then there's also Gabriel. Gabriel is the guy who gets embodied by Malachar. Mm -hmm. And Malachar, like I said before, he uses another dimension and uses Gabriel to, um, uh, you know, possesses him and uses him to interact in our world. Yeah. Well, through through that, Malachar, or through Gabriel, um, he becomes, he, his abilities, it's more like a, um, a necromancer mixed with a, uh, a sword summoner. So he's pretty badass. <laughs> um, so yeah, you'll see him summoning the undead and making rock monsters. And uh, he can create this pretty powerful army in the storyline. But he can also control, uh, create uh, energy swords out of midair and, and control them. Like make them fly around and things like that. And he's a really badass swordsman. Um, he also has a huge black dragon that he can create and fly around on. So he's, he's pretty radical. Mm -hmm. Um, and also he's extremely hard to kill. One of the things I have in the storyline is you can cut him up and he'll just regenerate and keep going. Um, you'll see in the storyline that it's, uh, you know, he'll eventually be defeated, but it's, it's pretty crazy how they have to pull it off. Yeah. Since he is so freaking powerful. Oh, obviously you don't. You don't want to have you don't want to have the villain curb stomped. I mean, this isn't a Disney right. Marvel movie, right? <laughs> well, I will, I will say that the fight they had to put for Thanos, shit. <laughs> um, just, I'm just sitting. Look, I'm not I'm not trying I'm not trying to hit anybody while they're down. I'm trying to kick them because that's right. easier, right? <laughs> um. And th and something like Thanos is the is the exception, and it's going to be the peak because well, right. it's, ne it's never going to get at that level again. Um, but the, but part of one thing I was curious about when it came to, when it came to that whole natural effect that the Karans have is why crystals. Um. I'm not sure exactly. I just thought it was pretty neat. Um, I wanted to give her this ability where she can create. I, I guess that's really what is what it is. I wanted to give her this ability where she can create uh, a weaponry. Um, whether she had access, you know, I mean, if she doesn't have, I didn't want to. I mean, I'm really want to make her like someone that carries a sword around all the time. Not that I'm distant characters like that, but I like the idea that no matter what, she'd always be able to pull something out. And uses a weapon it and um and i like the crystal idea because she can use it in lots of different ways she'll she can create a kind of armor on her um and of course she turned the crystals into spears and daggers into swords um she can even or axes she can create other weaponry for other characters to use as well um oh so i know you're big in rpg so um there's a lot there's you know, decent amount of games where a character you can create a weapon. I if you're familiar with Guild Wars 2, mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of Guild Wars 2 and and some of the classes in that game you're able to create weaponry for other characters to use. Like you can summon a sword, the sword comes from the sky, stabs in the ground, and your your ally can pick up that sword now and use it, and it gives them a, some new abilities for a limited time. Um and I, I like that I that's another thing too, like um a big influence on this book, like I mentioned before, is X Men, and one of my things that I, uh, about the X Men I love so much is the the team up aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Them using their abilities with each other's abilities, um, and also you know just using their abilities to help one another a lot. Um, so I'm a, I, I, that's another thing that will happen in this book. There's a lot of power combining, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so you know that that's one of the things too with her. Um, 
but the crystals there's a there's a fun thing I, I like i said i can't say there's another fun thing with the crystals that happens she can turn them into something else but i don't see what it is and um but uh, she the no one one of her fighting styles you'll see this in issue three i've, I've posted some pictures of it online where she's do, actually doing in this issue three where she'll create um uh, blades in her arms and her legs and then she'll spin around in the air making herself into like this giant blade so anything that's around her just gets cut up um, I really like that idea because she's very acrobatic and fast in, in battle. Um, I wanted to give that she's kind of like my rogue, if you will, you know. Yeah. Um, but more on a sci-fi, of course, uh, um, very sci-fi level. And without the southern draw. <laughs> southern draw. <laughs> is that is that the type of rogue you play? <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you had mentioned X. You had mentioned X Men. I know. I know. Later, you bring up Rogue. <laughs> right. Right. I'm at Rogue, as in like in. Uh, um, well, I see what you mean. She's, yeah, female. I'm at Rogue, like in the RPG sense. Yeah, it's like don't throw me off like that, man. <laughs> Look, it's my job to be unpredictable. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um. And when and um. I will ad- I I will admit when it came to Soren I did um I did tilt my head a little at the last name that you gave him mm-hmm. <laughs> Ravenholm Yeah um because we I'm don't not go sure there exactly why I gave him that name other than um I I just kind of thought it was cool and um well I actually I, I should take it back he's uh it, it's kind of a nod to I guess people like you and I who are big into um I guess you could say sci-fi, fantasy, entertainment, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, so just kind of a nod to that. That and I think that was a character and name I had years ago in a game, but yeah. yeah. I don't remember for I, sure. I just I, I just liked Raven Home and gave it to him. Yeah. Yeah. Um the main reason I bring it up is because is because well I, because we don't go to Ravenholm as as everybody learned when playing Half Life Two. <laughs> um, That's true. <laughs> uh, I do I do find I do find it interesting that um, in the case of Strife, you opted to give him a character like that a sense of humor because a lot of times when there's the robot trying to learn kind of character, mm-hmm. more often than not, writers seem to have a habit of making them the most serious or the most logical or the like. And that's not to say that he mm-hmm. that's not to say that strife isn't. But I have I have to wonder if if there if there was a kind of response to that ha- to that habit. So instead instead of having him do that, have him be the person who tries to that, bring that some is levity. The case. Yeah, that is the case. I've se- yeah, I agree. I've seen that a lot. Um with the character the robot's too serious or mm-hmm. or what have you. But um yeah, I wanted to give him a lighter personality. I wanted to make him, like you said, more fun. Um, I don't think I was really spoiling anything, but in issue three, there's okay. So Soren, he's a uh, uh, he's a big uh, heavy metal music fan, mm-hmm. and um, there is a scene in issue three where uh, he and, and Strife are, are riding in the in a military tank together, um, hover tank, and um, and Soren's listening to uh, um, some Slipknot, and uh, and he's sitting there, you know, headbanging. And he's showing Strife how to headbang. He's teaching Strife how to headbang. Yeah. Okay. So Strife's in there trying to get it down. <laughs> um. But the, but um, the other th- the other thing that I that I feel is definitely important is that the obviously the the primary apocalypse that's being fo- that's being focused on aside aside from the other material that that um is going to be touched upon in the future is the dread fiends. Mm-hmm. Um, now, when it came, now, I find it interesting to take this to take this sort of approach because a lot of times when we see apocalypse is done in fiction, it's usually either something completely unsaid, either the sometimes the nukes dropped, sometimes sometimes you've got good old zombies. But in mm-hmm. this case, we have um, full-on a- animalistic um, mutants. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, 
Okay, I'll 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 take a stab in the dark. Was one it was one of your inspirations the xenomorphs? A little bit. It's I would say um, actually more. Actually, no. There is something they do that's very xenomorphic. I'll, I'll tell you about that in a sec. But um, they're more inspired by uh, the thing, the alien from the thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even more so, the um, the mutants from the Resident Evil series. Which I can de- I can definitely I can definitely see that with the mm-hmm. the um a lot a lot of its aspects when you when you put it in that context a lot of the dread fiend aspects remind me of the um of the hunt of a bit of the hunter and a bit of the liquor type um mm-hmm. monsters from Resident Evil. Mm-hmm. Well, the overall idea of the to me the Resident Evil monsters and and also the the thing alien too, but uh, um. I, to me, it's you know they're like this ultimate biological weapon where mm-hmm. they're able to. Uh, well, I guess at to at the time in my mind, as far as I know, in science fiction, the Resident Evil creatures were the the ultimate. Where I've actually taken it a step further, but um, I'll get to that in a minute too. But mm-hmm. the the Dread Fiends, uh, I'm sorry the uh, the the Resident Evil creatures. They're they were they're they're really adaptive in the sense where you know they can self-mutate and you know there i remember playing the game and especially in the bosses where uh or the game series and especially the bosses where or the mini bosses too where oftentimes the, you'll fight them in one form and you think you got them and they mutate in something even more crazy and actually have to fight yeah. or you'll fight them at one point in the game you think you got them and they come back later in the game bigger and badder than before mm-hmm. um i love that concept of of just you know surprising uh, the viewer in the case of games or player or, 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 or reader in the case of comics where, um, you know, giving you these unpredictable enemies, you don't know what they're going to do next. Um, and with the dread fiends, like you said, they, they, they're able to like the, the res evil creatures, they're able to um, mutate themselves. But uh, I was they they mutate themselves in more radical ways than the Resident Evil monsters, where they're able. To, okay, so when they eat a life form, a biological life form, be it human, animal, or whatever, even their own kind, they will break it down very rapidly and use that as a a, a fuel to then allow themselves to mutate. Um, and so then they can make themselves bigger, stronger, extra arms if they need them, extra legs, wings for flight. Um, they can even uh, clone themselves if they want to. They'll make another one. Like, say, they're, they're by themselves and they're outnumbered. They can eat something, quickly turn that into a clone, regurgitate it. Now there's two of them. And the clone grows very rapidly into a full size. So, like I said, very unpredictable. Um, there's a big moment and it happens in the second issue that leads in over into third issue where you get a very radical new mutation from them. That's, that's pretty insane. Um, I'm very proud of that concept that me and my artist came up with, uh, for that new mutation. But, um, and I can't wait for, for everyone to see it. Well, actually I'm, I'm sorry, post posting pictures, but also to see what happens and how it's so radical in the storyline. But, um, there was something else I was going to say. What was it? I don't remember now. Something you said earlier. And, uh... Um... It's... It... More, it, um... It was... what? Well, the last thing I had asked was was in regard to the inspirations for the um, Dread Fiends. Um, mm-hmm. And you had, you had kind of touched on... The, on um, that, because I had meant I had mentioned that the hunters and the oh, I that's what it was. Mm-hmm. I remember now the the xenomorph thing. Mm-hmm. That what what? Yeah. Um, so if you remember, from what I understand in the alien films, and I I can't remember. I think I've looked online too to confirm it as far as the you know, the lore and the canon, but they don't really tell you in the movies what how they do it. But it seems like to me when they create structures like their hives. Or like when you had um, uh, Newt encased in the the weird slime stuff at the end of the second one, Ripley goes and saves her, and it's that weird kind of crystal hardened stuff that you know to imprison her. I believe they generate that like from their saliva, like it dries over time, mm-hmm. or they at least secrete it in some way. 
And the Dread Fiends, they actually, their saliva is more of a, it's like a blood red. And um, they um, will actually use that and to it hardens over time. It takes a little while, but it will harden. And they we, they use that to to build um, to enforce their hives in the storyline. Which uh, so this this turns into this uh, dark reddish crystal type structures that they create um, that you'll see later in the storyline. But that's an idea I have for them, and I thought it was pretty cool. But it it definitely takes from you know the the xenomorph. Uh, I'd, I'd like the idea of these. They kind of like how I guess ants, you know, can create uh, structures out of saliva and, mm-hmm. and other structures, other things, and and how wasps will make you know nests out of mud and what have you. Yeah. Um. So that kind of same concept. I've always thought that was pretty cool. That as well. I took from insects where the the the, the dread fiends um, will act on a kind of hive um, mind at times. They're not like permanently linked together in that sense but they will um from time to time um work together really well um like that but there's a particular um hive of dread fiends if you will there are um, a colony of dread fiends Mm -hmm. that comes in the storyline later on and it is all linked to this kind of super brained dread fiend um this kind of queen dread fiend where she's Okay, so like I said earlier, when they'll eat something and then they'll use that biofuel to change themselves to mutate to adapt. Well, this queen has chosen to use majority of her consumption of, of life forms to her mental ability. So she's like this crazy, super disgusting brain thing that can't move very well, but she's linked to all of her hive and is able to strat- get, send them like strategy um, um commands and what have you and then they're, they're become the they're a pretty you know hard to defeat colony that comes to be in the storyline um there's some other really dark twisted stuff that happens with it but i can't say anything it happens yeah. to do with uh has to do with a couple other characters yeah obviously um now you recently fin- now you recently finished um kickstart you recent well i, can- I shouldn't say kickstarting sorry that's bad habit um, <laughs> now issue two is, uh, is in demand on, on Indiegogo. And mm-hmm. I believe you mentioned that issue three sh- will be heading to Indiegogo sometime later this year, s- sometime before the end, before the end of 2020. Um, mm-hmm. what would you say have been some of the learning experiences you've taken from crowdfunding the first issue and crowdfunding the second issue? Um, well, a big thing is definitely um, look at the analogy of, of you know casting your net um, as far as um, uh, getting getting people aware mm-hmm. uh, enough people aware uh, of your your project. Um, starting out with the first campaign, uh, my net was very small. And uh, I was having a good deal of difficulty at first um, raising enough money. I had raised a little over a thousand at that point, and I was shooting for I think six thousand in that campaign. Um, but then I um, I found uh, you know a, a broader community of comic fans. And, uh, and also comic book creators. And that really helped a lot. So I would say, you know, definitely, I, it's, it's not easy, though. It's like, um, I actually found it through a friend of mine. Um, and, uh, well, I mean, are you familiar? With, wait, are you Comic Skate? Are you familiar with Comic Skate? Oh, I'm yeah. I am, okay. I am very, okay. I am okay. very, fam- I am very familiar with it. I, um, okay. I have, even though, even though, even though for the for a good chunk of it, I've I've been kind of on an outside looking in. I have right. Um, I've tried to extend as many olive branches as I, as I can with with people in and out of it, saying, and I I know I know there's the whole thing with with war campaign. And I'm like, look, if you look, if you want to come, if you want to come in and t- and talk about what you're um working on, the door is always open. Just remember to dress mm-hmm. casual and bring drinks. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> Good rules. <laughs> oh. But uh but yeah, so a friend of mine introduced me to them and uh and I just found a bunch of, you know, like mighty comic book fans that, you know, just wanted to make good comics again and give them to the world. And, and, uh, and they all really started to like, well, not, I mean, not all of them, but a lot of them started liking my project. And I just found a lot of great projects in there too that I, I funded and, and have been supporting. And, and, uh, so, yeah, I mean, that, that was a big part of, of where I am now. And I don't know where I'd, I mean, maybe I would have found another community or what have you, but it seems like to me it's it's getting harder to find, um, I guess, supportive communities in terms of the like the indie comic scene. Um, maybe I just haven't looked around enough, but comic comic skate has has been real good to me, and and I'm real thankful for that. And um, and I'm I'm glad I've you know, like like I said, I've found some great books through the, through it, and and see new ones all the time and and sometimes i'm mad at myself for not, not having enough money to fund them all the ones that i want but um but uh but yeah that was a, a big hurdle was finding you know a, a broader audience also another one was um finding a good um printer uh well uh, one that was affordable for me and um, like my the one I used for the first campaign, they it was a Chinese company, and not that I'm dissing like Chinese printers so much, but this one in particular kind of did me dirty. They they sent me, you know, my books, and uh, I think it was like a couple of the boxes worth, which was actually a couple hundred bar hundred hundred copies worth of book um, were pretty damaged, um, pretty bad, and and I asked them if they would refund me if there's anything they could do about it, and they just cut ties from me. They never they just stopped talking to me. So I was like, "Wow, okay, fuck you guys," <laughs> and yeah. So the next one I went with was Mixum for uh, for issue two, and they did me really good. They they did uh, when they 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 sent the books. A few of them were damaged, but they um, reimbursed me by not like just the amount they they reimbursed me like four times the amount of the damage of books. I was like, "Wow!" So and I asked them like, "You sure?" Like, "Yeah, go ahead, man. You're good." I'm like, "All right." <laughs> Because I think it was only like maybe maybe twenty five dollars worth or somewhere in that range of damage, um, and they sent me a hundred dollars. So I was like, "Wow!" Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm so glad I went with them. The great quality too. I'm definitely going with them for issue three, and um, very affordable as well. I think they're from what I've seen the most affordable um, indie print. I mean, uh, uh, indie printer uh, or just you know comic book printer. Um, and let's see, is there anything else that was really big? Um, I guess kind of getting down uh, a, a process of with my artists, with getting um, learn, learning, you know, how, how they worked and, and, and like how I thought what i wanted with the story or with the, the look and what have you um but that one actually went pretty quick that wasn't like a really hard thing it was just took a, a little little bit more time than I, I was hoping for but i think that's just also with you know getting the style down and the look and um character designing and what have you um but yeah otherwise it was pretty pretty good um uh yeah i can't think of anything else <laughs> Yeah. Um, now, I now I know you. I know you meant you mentioned that. Um, you meant, now with it now with it. What's the what's the current physical status of issue two? I know I know that some some folk are getting it um, in uh, PDF form, but mm -hmm. do you do you see do you see that getting off to the off to the printers um, by the end of the year? You mean issue three, or because issue two is is done, like oh, it's wow. printed. Yeah, it's all shipped out. Mm -hmm. There's everyone who's ordered it so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, has gotten their copies. Yeah. Um, when it comes to it, when it comes to issue three, what I know you I know you said sometime between October and December, but um, mm -hmm. are you shooting for like a November release window or? I yeah. Um, 
so a a little hurdle that we ran into recently, or a bump in the road, was um, are you familiar with the comic book flatter? With what? With a flat with a flatter, what a flatter is? Um, kind of, but for the benefit of the audience, would you mind going into that? Yeah, um, actually, it's kind of hard to explain, uh, but I, I think I do a pretty good job. Um, I wasn't sure exactly what one was until recently, where I okay. So what happened was the um the flatter that my colorist uses uh for whatever reason i'm not sure exactly why and i don't think my colorist is really either he's he just stopped turning in work and like he just started slacking I, i'm not sure maybe something happened to him i don't know but um hopefully not but he just stopped turning in work so and my colorist was telling me hey i'm not getting you know any flatter pages back um you know i mean i'm he said, I asked, I asked him, you know, well, at first, actually, I had the idea to see if um, I can learn how to do it or my wife. Um, my wife's become pretty good with Photoshop, especially since she now letters the book. Mm-hmm. Um, she lettered issue two and she's going to letter issue three. But uh, um, and she's been practicing. I've been trying to find time to do it, but I've writing scripts and stuff and other things. It's it's getting it's a little hard for me. But um, but. It also takes time, more time than we thought, because flying looks kind of easy, but it's, it's actually not. It, it's, it's there's a little more to it than that. So uh, she's going to keep trying. Maybe over time she become more of a flatter. But my idea was to well, we would flatten, and he wouldn't have to pay anybody to flatten for him. We would just do it, and then he could keep more of the money that I'm paying him. But uh, but that's not what going to work out for now. So I, I asked him, you know, go ahead and try to find a, a, another flatter. And he said he's got a guy in mind, and and there, he's supposed to start soon. So you know, hope, you know that sh- that uh, that that bump is done hopefully. Um, but a flatter basically is okay. So when you're wanting to color a comic book page, um, the flatter's job is to make it easier for the actual color basically. And some some colorists do their own flatting also. Mm-hmm. But it takes, if you're a good flatter, it takes about three to four hours to flatten a page, depending on how detailed the page is. Um, and a lot of colorists, you know, that's time out of them when they can just be coloring other pages, actual pages are done flatting. So a lot of colorists will actually pay someone to do it like 10 to $25 a page. And what a flatter does is they will sit there and take um, the, like the lasso tool and Photoshop um and those kinds of types of tools and they'll they'll outline all the details in the page like the the character's face or their arms and what have you and the the colors like for instance like we'll say like Zathara in my book where if she's got her her crystal blades out Mm -hmm. and her her red eyes and her red hair the flatter would sit there and um highlight all those parts and then make them all red and and then they'll do another part, like the say a part of her armor where it's purple, and it'll make it all purple. Parts are blue, and all those will be blue, or whatever those colors are on, of those those parts of the page are those colors. And what it's doing is it's line, it's making sure that all of the colors underneath the line art is touching together, so that it, when the printing process, if there's any kind of um, if the printing is a little off. And if not everything's colored properly underneath all the lines, you can see like white lines there and the art doesn't look good. But also this process allows the colorist to then when he has the color or she, um, all they have to do is select now that section, like all the sections where they're red. So Zatara's mm-hmm. blades, her hair, her eyes, and and then just color those parts very quickly. And then the next parts, the next parts, the next parts. So it really saves the colorist tons of time and makes the them you know going in and, and coloring much easier and it gives them more time to add more details and and what have you um especially if they're on a time restraint and um so yeah it's it's basically a flatter i think i described it pretty well i might have left something out but that's basically what they are and i was real confused what they were for a long time i'm like why are you paying this guy to do this? And then watching videos and stuff like that, I yeah, I definitely get it more now. And yeah, it's just part of the process. Mm-hmm. And for uh, digital comics, that's another thing too. I kind of, I mean, digital comics, you get better colors and depth and and detail. But uh, I also think about man, they had it a lot easier back in the day when they're hand drawn everything. You didn't have to worry about a flatter. <laughs> yeah, although although um, 
there were probably other issues that they that they had to worry that they had to worry about. Um, mm. And when when it comes to when it comes to inking the um, the big the biggest the, once again this is a case where I have to bury Rob Liefeld again. But <laughs> um, a long time ago, Image was doing a was doing a crossover event with um, Valiant called Deathmate, and. Mm-hmm. Hit and um the book that Liefeld was supposed to do with it, I think it was I think it was the black book, was ridiculously late, mm. and the ink and Valiant's inker basically did a sit in <laughs> at Liefeld's house and wouldn't leave until he got until he got the pages, and wow. then he went back to his hotel room and inked them. Ha! <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Um. Gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> Look, I've learned that the I've learned that the best way to get things done is to be incomprehensibly annoying. Mm. <laughs> um, but with that said, with that said, I I'm definitely gonna be looking forward to see, to seeing um how issue three develops when mm-hmm. when that comes around. And once again, I I can't thank you enough for taking the time to venture through the mists of time zones to come all the way up to the temple. <laughs> well, thanks for having me in the mm-hmm. temple. It's it's quite a place. Mm-hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to talk about um, issue three or just or just a shit post about wh- about the eternal debate on whether Gundam or Macross is better, <laughs> <laughs> um, the door is the door is always open to you. Awesome. That, Appreciate as it. I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> yeah, I. I I got pretty drunk this weekend, so I was like, ah, maybe I shouldn't drink this tonight. So I didn't. I haven't. I have not imbibed tonight. <laughs> oh, I, um, maybe uh, next time. <laughs> yeah, we'll say we'll say we'll save it for next time because can't go can't go all in at once. Then you, we saw what happened to the we saw what happened to the hair that whole story. <laughs> um, and of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!